Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'm going to talk to you about quorum sensing in bacteria. And it's a really fascinating story about how bacteria are able to communicate with one another and sense each other's presence by releasing small chemical molecules. But before we can get into that conversation about uh, quorum sensing and communication, I want to talk to you in general about prokaryotes, talk to you a little bit about bacteria and archaea, give you some of the basic principles about these microorganisms so that we'll be able to communicate and so you can appreciate some of the subtleties. So one of the things you just have to realize, and, and don't be freaked out by it, is that these prokaryotes are everywhere. When I say everywhere, I mean it. <laughs> this is a picture of one right here. This is its it, they're single-celled, and all these little sort of tentacle-like structures that are coming off the side are called pili, and they're hollow extensions in which their DNA can be exchanged in these tubes to other bacteria. It's a way in which they can conjugate. So prokaryotes are the earliest organisms on the planet Earth. So the very first form of life is prokaryote. And so prokaryote, if you recall this from somewhere in your biological past, Pro is sort of like pre, like a prequel, something coming before. So before a nucleus. So these are without membrane-bound nucleus. And they're also without membrane-bound organelles. They're very small. And so, boy, they've been living on the earth since life is, was conceived. And so they had the run of the place for over over a, mil, a billion years. And so this... this Prokaryotes have just been dominating for a long time. They still dominate. And so they're everywhere. And so if you took the collective biomass, uh, it would outweigh all the eukaryotes combined by tenfold. <laughs> so we're talking about small, microscopic, but so numerous that their biomass is humongous. And so just to get a just a sense, it's hard to understand the scale of this. I, I, I can barely grasp it. Is that prokaryotes, if you were to grab a handful of soil uh, or else from your mouth or, or skin, it would be more than the total number of humans that have ever lived. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Huge. And so they're everywhere. They, they thrive under the most extreme habitats where it's too cold for eukaryotes. We're a eukaryote having a nucleus. It's too hot, prokaryotes are there. Too cold, prokaryotes are there. Too salty, it's there. Too acidic, they're there. Too alkaline, they're there. So if you look at these hot springs here in Yellowstone National Park, all of these wild colors, these reds and yellows and things like this, these are all prokaryotes that happen to be thriving in this hot, hot, sulfur-rich environment. They're thermophiles. They like it hot. <laughs> and what's interesting is when you're adapted to that, cold would actually hurt you or room temperature would actually hurt you so it's kind of an interesting thing so they've been on the on the earth for billions of years and you know just to contrast this humans have only been on the earth for a few hundred thousand years so it's it's been their planet it, it is their planet and so one of the keys to their success is is twofold so one of the things is that they evolve on a sort of a fast scale. So there's a tremendous amount of diversity here. So when I say evolve, I mean like they're changing. Because of the fact that they can divide every 30 minutes, that's pretty quick. And so plus the fact that they've been living on the earth for such a long time, they've had a, a long time to explore all of the chemical diversities on the earth and occupy all these interesting niches. And so one of the reasons why they're able to sort of be adaptive and roll is that they, you know, this is a lesson in life. They make a lot of mistakes. And so the, sometimes these mistakes that occur during replication, they get passed on. And sometimes some of the mistakes are good. It'll just happen. They're fortuitous. And so they help the bacteria or prokaryote, I shouldn't say bacteria, the prokaryote evolve and and uh, adapt to a particular environment. And that's what's given them their incredible diversity. The fact that they mutate often, that they've been around for a long time. It's incredible. So, you know, when we think about prokaryotes, we think about maybe diseases and serious things. But 
the the fact is the the minority of them are the ones that are causing illness although i don't want to diminish it because it's pretty severe so you may recall this from your history class in the 14th century the bubonic plague it wiped out a quarter of the human population so it's very serious and so you know there's other types of bacteria that are still with us today that are troublesome like tb or cholera and, and a lot of these sexually transmitted diseases and then we're always concerned about bacteria getting into our food causing causing food poison but you know those are the minority but they get the headlines but the majority of the bacteria are beneficial or at the very least benign they're not causing any harm at all. So what are some examples of, of what they could do beneficially? Well, they live in our intestines and, you know, especially in our large intestine, our, the E. coli live there and they produce vitamins, vitamins that we need. So prokaryotes are also critically important in the ecosystem. They inhabit the soil and when organisms did, uh, die, they are, help break down the larger molecules into smaller ones, and therefore those smaller elements become available to be taken in in the soil by plants. And so they're like a transition and allowing the biogeochemical cycling of critical elements. And they also help to produce part of our atmosphere. They can take in nitrogen from the atmosphere and bring it into the soil. So each, each of these things is monumentally important. There's a picture here of some bacteria and roots that are important in helping to, they live in symbiosis with plants in order to help them nitrogen fix, bring in nitrogen from the atmosphere. And then, you know, our, even in eu eukaryote, like plant cells and, um, and even in our cells, that pro, uh, single cell, <laughs> sorry, single cell prokaryotes uh, that were once free living are now thought to be the ancestors of the modern day chloroplasts and also mitochondria were thought to be prokaryotes it's something called the endosymbiotic theory how do we know this because they actually have their own ribosomes and they also have their own circular dna chloroplasts and mitochondria do so how about that that once upon a time prokaryotes uh, were taken in and plants have these inside of them today well, in terms of classification, I want to make this perfectly clear because sometimes, you know, taxonomy is something that changes and it's all it's subject to arguments and debate and when when you're trying to classify things. But, you know, so take it with a grain of salt, but this is what we think today in terms of classification. We now believe that bacteria and another group called archaea are two branches of prokaryotic evolution. And what I mean by that is that recently molecular evidence, and what I mean by molecular evidence is this next generation DNA sequencing can really quickly look at the genome of these microorganisms. And when you compare DNA sequences, you really get a sense of who's more closely related. And so we've had to make some adjustments as it turns out that this sort of old system of five kingdoms isn't really working out for us so much. And so, as it turns out, we have these two branches. We have bacteria and archaea. The archaea are prokaryote and the bacteria are prokaryote. The, the difference, the main difference, I won't go into detail, but the archaea are the ones that can really handle these like really extreme environmental conditions. They're the ones that really have a bizarre biochemistry and physiological characteristics that allow them to tolerate really hot environment, really cold, real salty, that kind of thing. So they're the, what you'd call extremophiles. <laughs> they like the extreme. So archaea. And so when you look at it this way, pictorially, you can see that, you know, the, the, uh, the universal ancestor to everything. So we have up here, we have three domains. And so we have a domain of uh, and this is above kingdom. We have a domain of bacteria, we have a domain of archaea, and then a domain for eukaryotes. Now we belong into this domain. And then in the kingdom, animal kingdom, below that, phylum chordata, etc. Below that, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So we're in this domain of eukaryotes. And how about this? 
it turns out from this DNA evidence that we're more closely related to the archaea. Do you see how the longer the line is, the more time has gone by? But we're closer related to archaea than we are to bacteria. It's kind of interesting. So what's the story with this bacteria? Well, they're unicellular, so often one cell, and they take on these different shapes. You need a microscope to see them. They're microscopic. And so the circular ones are called uh, coccus or cocci. And the rod-shaped ones are bacillus or bacilli. And then there's some hel helical-shaped ones that are called spirilli. And so they're everywhere. They, you know, they are, they're all on our skin. They're inside of our body. They're all over the table. They're all over your paper. You're hold, holding your pencil. It's they're everywhere. The whole earth is filled. It's their planet. And you haven't seen any of these unless you have a microscope. Fortunately, we have microscopes, so we'll be checking this out. So if you looked at your arm, you looked at your hand, you, what you would be seeing is it's completely covered with, with uh, microbial life. <laughs> and it's like it's more prokaryote than eukaryote. It's more them than you it's remarkable. Like, for example, if you were to just take a swab of inside of like your teeth, you'd come up with like 600 different species of bacteria that are living in there, like in a community. It's incredible. And so here's the thing, bacteria rule. And most of life, most of you, like you took of life, a pie of life, it's microbial. And so, you know, what are we dealing with here? We're a single cell, of course, we have every living thing has a plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer. Every living thing has ribosomes to make protein. And then there's DNA, no nucleus. Sometimes they have circular rings of DNA called plasmids. Sometimes they have a sugary capsule on, out, on the outside of their cell wall. Now, I'm not going to go too far with this, though I, I, I'm inclined. Uh, Different kinds of bacteria have different kinds of cell walls. That'll be a different discussion. But sometimes they have the sugary capsule, sometimes they don't. These extensions coming off to the side I mentioned before are pili. They're hollow and their DNA can exchange. And then sometimes some of them have this big protein tail called the flagella that helps them move. And so they're not going very far, but they, they are a little mobile. And so they, uh, you know, they appear simple and they consume nutrients. They grow, they divide very quickly, they're everywhere. They're, they're even on the bottom of the ocean in the abyssal zone, the deep thermal vents, they're down there as well. They could be hot, cold, they're everywhere. And so the numbers, just to sort of nail this point home, is that we're talking about that, you know, if we have about a trillion cells that make us up, a trillion cells that make up the human body, there's about 10 trillion bacteria in you and on you. So it's 10 trillion prokaryotes, 1 trillion human. So the truth is, and this is, I don't know, 10% <laughs> human, 90% bacteria. Ooh. This brings up an interesting conversation about what organisms really even are. <laughs> This is, this is a serious thing. I'm not going to go too far with that. <laughs> Remind you that this is a conversation about bacterial quorum sensing, and we're trying to get a, a handle on bacteria. So they're, they're in you. They're, out, they're on you. They're all over. So the question is, what are they doing? You know, most of the time, bacteria are good. They're living in a mutual, meaning both beneficial, symbiotic association with organisms, whether they be with plants or with us. And so... You know, there's so many of them that they have a lot of genes in their DNA that we don't have. I mean, that only makes sense. So we have about 30,000 genes. This number is debated. Um, but if you were to count up the bacterial genes, that's about 100 times more than we have. Of course, there's so many of them. And so they encode, the DNA of prokaryotes encode all kinds of functions of, of making things and proteins that we don't even have. So they're they could be producing things that we that we can't produce, and so, you know, you you uh, you've heard of the ones that help digest and the ones that uh, produce vitamins. And so here's an example of this. Here's E. coli, and E. coli can make vitamin K. 
This is a pitcher of vitamin K. Now we can't make that, but we need vitamin K. So the fact that there's E. coli living with us, it's helping us out. And we're like, well, what are we doing for the E. coli? Well, we're providing a, a nice environment for them to grow. And so, you know, we've not evolved all of these important functions ourselves. And so we are reliant upon these prokaryotes. It's kind of interesting that we rely on small microscopic organisms to live. That shouldn't be as a surprise because I was saying earlier that the whole biogeochemical cycling has to do with prokaryotes. And without them, we wouldn't survive on the planet Earth. We need them. But, you know, they still cause problems. And I don't want to, you know, make diminish this. They can be terrible pathogens like, you know, TB is kind of a brutal uh, lung uh, bacterial infection. That's not good. So, you know, the question really is, you know, whether it be good or bad, here's the question. What, you know, how can they do anything at all? They're so small. What are they even capable of? How can they do what they do? And so the thing is, what they do is, so they're very small and how, you know, they, how can they get anything going? And so this is what this quorum sensing is all about. Apparently, the strength of bacteria is the number of bacteria. And so they act as a group. There's kind of a community interaction occurring there. And so let's get into this conversation. So how can we possibly understand these complicated associations with plants and bacteria, human and bacteria? So what we need is a, like a simple system. It's pretty hard to study all the thousands and thousands of different species of bacteria in our body. So what we're looking for is a sort of a one-to-one association and maybe by studying that we can sort of break it down and then understand the other relationship so there's a host that would be you and there's bacteria so if, if we can find just one bacteria and look at the association we might come to a better understanding of this and so scientists have been searching around for this and we found the most incredibly interesting example of this is where do you hear this there's a squid called a bobtail squid and what happens is that it's that nature provides this really cool example of a one-to-one -one relationship and, it, and this crazy relationship exists in the ocean right so here's a squid and it has a relationship with a bacteria called this is the genus and species vibrio fisheri vibrio fisheri and so Fibrio fisheri is a symbiont, meaning that it lives inside of the bobtail squid. And so uh, what's particularly good is something the bacterium does for the squid. Now, the squid provides a nice house for it to live and provides lots of, of nutrients. You know, it's tough going in, in the ocean. There's not a lot of nutrients. And so if you're a bacteria living in a squid, you know, this is the high life. Uh, you know, but what's the bacteria doing for the squid? Well, the bacteria is bioluminescent, which means that it has the ability to, to glow, sort of like a firefly tail. So it makes light. And so, you know, so what? Well, as it turns out, bacteria are very small, so they're kind of invisible. And so it's hard to know what's going on with them. And what they do inside the cell is even more invisible. But the bioluminescence, you can actually see. It makes, it makes sort of the invisibleness of a bacteria visible. Like, in other words, when you see glow, you're like, hey, there's bacteria. And so you can see that. It's pretty conspicuous. And so we can see it with our eyes. And it's sort of a reporter that the bacteria are doing something. When they're glowing, they're producing um, proteins necessary for bioluminescence. And so what, what about the partnership then? So what's going on? So here's from the squid's point of view. It's a you know, it's kind of a peaceful animal. It's sort of just very quiet and it's nocturnal, which means that during the day, it's kind of conspicuous and doesn't want to really come out. And so it hides in the sand and it, and it even burrows and covers itself up with sand so that the predators aren't going to eat it. So it's kind of scared. <laughs> so the thing is you can't hide in the sand uh, for, for your whole life. You can hide during the day, but you got to come out at night to eat. And so it does come out at night to hunt. And so as it turns out, the squid isn't invisible. And so when there's a predator, and especially when it's in shallow water, there's a predator, the moonlight comes down and it shines where the squid lives in the shallow water. And as it turns out, 
it casts a shadow and, and predators can see it. And also when you look up, if you're swimming, a predator swimming under the squid is going to be able to see the, the, the silhouette, if you will, of the squid and it's going to give it away. And so this is where the bacteria come in. So the, 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 uh, the Vibrio fisheri, the bioluminescent ones. And so inside the squid, there's a specialized organ inside the squid called the light organ. And it's sort of like a little dorm room that houses all of this bacteria, like a lot of bacteria are living inside this light organ. And so as it turns out, when the bacteria reach these really high numbers, what happens is that they're able to bioluminesce. And what, so the selection evolutionary for the bacteria is that the squid feeds it, okay? So that this is good for the bacteria to live with, with the squid. And so the bacteria that live in the squid get have to have more offspring. So this is a good thing for bacteria. So the bacteria benefit. And the way the bio, bioluminescence works is that when it shines, the lower side of the squid shines. And so predators find it difficult. And so I have to show you this picture here. So here's a squid. So if we're a predator looking up, the bioluminescent bacteria sort of creates something called counter illumination. So the predator has a difficult time seeing it. And so, and it also doesn't cast as great of a shadow. And so even from above, it's difficult to, to see it. So this is real beneficial. So, hey, the squid is like, yes, I like Vibrio fisheri making bioluminescence. And so this is what I was saying before about this. It's sort of an anti-predatory strategy. In other words, the bacteria get fed and the squid becomes invisible as a result of this association. So it's mutual. So the bacteria have this light organ, which it houses the bacteria, which makes it uh, counter and therefore can't be seen. So here's the here's the curious thing about this relationship. So during the day, okay, so this is how it relates to population ecology a little bit. So during the day, the bacteria are in low numbers and it does take them a while to, to divide and the numbers increase. So as they're increasing and increasing and increasing through the day, at nighttime, at nighttime, this isn't literally here. So at nighttime, there's a lot of them inside the squid and so they're able to bioluminesce. And so check this out. So starting in the morning, the squid's in the sand, right? So there's very few bacteria there, so it's not glowing. So it doesn't matter, it doesn't need light. So because the bacteria are getting fed by the squid and there's lots of food there, the bacteria are growing, growing, exponentially growing, 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 growing. So at night, the squid comes out of the sand and there's like all kinds of bacteria that are inside the squid and so it's glowing. So it's bioluminescent at nighttime only. So check this out. So as the bacteria grow all day long and then when they come out at night, that's when the bioluminescence is really looking good. But here's my question. Here's my question I have right here, which is, um, why right here is the most bioluminescence happening in the squid? And you're like, well, this is an easy question. It, it's probably because there's more bacteria. Okay, maybe. So when at night, when the bacteria are in large numbers, they make a lot of night, uh, a lot of light. But as it turns out, as the evening goes on, the squid can't keep letting these bacteria grow and grow and grow because it'll, it'll sort of exhaust the, back, the, the squid's ability to keep them going. So what happens is when the sun comes up in the morning, the, squirt, the, the squid squirts out the bacteria. And so what's fascinating about that, it's sort of like a circadian rhythm. So this is circa, meaning around a day rhythm. So in the morning, they get rid of, they pump out 95% of the bacteria so the numbers drop off. So what's curious is that the bacteria don't bioluminesce in low numbers. They only bioluminesce in high numbers. And so when they're diluted, the squid doesn't really care because it doesn't need to glow. It goes under the into the sand. And so this keeps going on over and over and over. And so um, it's how when this happens, the bacteria 
cultures are fresh and so they keep growing up growing up and so you can see this like for example during the day they grow up and when they're in high numbers they bioluminesce and then in the daytime they squirt it all out and then they grow up again and so there's this population cycling day night and it helps the squid survive and so in part two of this conversation believe me there's a little bit more we'll talk a little bit about how the bacteria are able to sense the fact that there's other bacteria around because remember it's the high number that allow them to bioluminesce and that's where the quorum sensing comes into play so i hope you enjoyed part one of quorum sensing uh, in bacteria and the bobtail squid thanks for watching <laughs>